You're sitting this thing. What? Hi, thanks for uh, staying for the, uh, the last uh, presentation of the day here. Dan's telling me to sit right next to him, which I will. Um, my name is Hung Wen, and uh, I run uh, West Coast offices for Visible Measures. I am Dan Beer. I work at uh, Prairie and Odell, an agency here in San Francisco. And uh, we're going to take you inside uh, the Inside Experience, which was uh, the first social movie campaign. Uh, done with Intel and Toshiba. So we'll give you, uh, we'll present you a case study. Uh, but before we do that, let me give you a little bit of background on uh, Visible Measures, who we are, and uh, where we fit in, in the uh, video ecosystem. Uh, some of you might uh, be familiar with us via the uh, viral video charts that we power on AdAge, uh, Variety, iMedia, and Motor Trend. Uh, we've been around for about five years now, and uh, we started uh, by partnering with publishers like Microsoft, Google, AOL, Yahoo, uh, Metacafe, Break, Funny or Die, ESPN, the list goes on. So anywhere where a video is being consumed by audiences, where they chose to click to initiate a video view, we were partnering with those publishers to provide them with deeper level analytics into uh, how their content was performing, right? So what this allowed the publishers to do was to better monetize uh, their video content, but also uh, it influenced their content strategy, essentially. Then brands came to us and they said, hey, we, we like that you sit at the intersection of all of these video providers and you know, we're running with all of these guys when it comes to video, but there's no way to standardize the metrics when it comes to video, right? Everybody's reporting on a different metric, a different engagement. Uh, so you know, they work with us to uh, help them essentially measure their brand video performance right? across these 300, 400 sites that we are now implemented with. And then eventually the same brands came to us and said, hey, uh, we love what you're doing from the measurement uh, perspective, right? We love the data and we love how you're starting to standardize these metrics, but how do we make that data more actionable? How do we leverage the historical data uh, that's platform agnostic to determine where we put video in front of people so that they would actually choose to view it? And that was the birth of Viewable Media about six months ago and, and Viewable Media is a choice-based video ad network uh, which guarantees user-initiated video views and optimizes uh, for earned media. So I wanna, before we get into the inside experience case study, I wanna uh, step back and look at the evolution of, uh, of video. There, there's certainly been some watershed moments that have informed uh, where we are today and, and potentially where we will be uh, in the future. And I think one of the key examples uh, that really paints a good portrait of how far we've gone in video is really BMW Films, uh, the BMW Film series, which launched in 2001. And I remember uh, when the series first launched, I remember you know, logging into my dial-up connection, 56K or whatever it is, at 9 p.m. Uh, at my mother's house and uh, initiating the download. And then the next day, the next morning, I'd check on it at 10 p.m., 10 a.m., and I'd, I'd see that... Uh, that it was 80% complete, and by the time I returned in the afternoon after lunch break, uh, finally I could see the three-minute video, right? Uh, produced by uh, Guy Ritchie and starring Clive Owen. Uh, and then fast forward to five years later, and YouTube starts to enable users to click a button and immediately initiate a video stream. Right? How powerful is that, right? So from a technology perspective, we've certainly come a long way. From a content perspective, right, we've also, we've also evolved. And what do we see now? Uh, with YouTube, you see the webcam series, right? So it's the, it, it became the start of the uh, consumer producer, right? And so the proliferation of content and hence uh, the difficulty in brands making sure that their videos are, are visible within those ecosystems. Um, and I think, you know, as far as the breakout campaigns and, and, and the watershed campaigns, you know, Dove Evolution really showed us what the potential of choice-based video uh, could offer, and then obviously, uh, you know, Old Spice, right? Real-time responses uh, could not be made available without those technologies and the change in uh, in content. So there's a there's a huge transformation occurring when it comes to uh, uh, media consumption, how how users are consuming content, right? 
Uh, there's two ways for advertisers and marketers to get their videos seen by audiences. One, you can interrupt their experience. Right? That's the pre-roll, mid-roll, post-roll, the uh, panel that uh, was just up here uh, discussed. And um, you know, that, that model hasn't changed from radio and television broadcasts, right? So it's the same mechanism by which you know, there's an in implicit contract between the, uh, the consumer and the content provider that in order to get to the content that you actually want to see, you'll tolerate the 15 seconds or you'll tolerate the 30 seconds of add-on that I'm gonna show you ahead of time, right? Uh, today, the consumer has a lot more control over what they consume, right? And hence, the, uh, uh, the opportunity for advertisers to leverage a choice-based video. Some call it social video, some call it viral video, branded entertainment, branded content. There's a ton of nomenclature uh, out there, but uh, I'll call it social video. Um, and so, you know, with, with choice-based, it's, you know, it's not about interrupting the user. Uh, you know, it's not about interrupting what the, the user is interested in. It's actually about being what the user is interested in, right? So it's about creating content that the user will, uh, will engage with. So with, uh, with Facebook and Twitter, right, brands can participate in the conversation by using social, social media. But video today remains the most dynamic uh, way to engage uh, users, and for, for brands, who you know, are concerned with, uh, with how their communication is spread and how their communication is, being, uh, uh, is performing within these uh, environments, video is still a very discrete unit of sight, sound, and motion, right? So you still can, can control some of the messaging that you put out there. So I mentioned that we power the adage uh, viral video chart, and we do that by measuring every single social video campaign out there uh, on behalf of a brand advertiser. So whether we're engaged with the brand or not. And uh, so we report that information uh, to AdAge every week and uh, that gets uh, published on Thursday with the top 10 performing viral video campaigns of the previous week. And so choice is an option for brand marketers, but are, are users and consumers really choosing when given the opportunity to view advertising, right? It sounds counter, counterproductive. Right, and counterintuitive, but they actually are. And so, you know, this, this chart here illustrates that. Uh, in 2009, at the end of 2009, in order to make the viral video chart, the minimum threshold uh, to be in the, the number 10 slot was, you know, you had to generate 250,000 views a week for your piece of creative, right? By the beginning of 2011, uh, the minimum threshold ended up being about 750,000 views, close to 800,000 views to make that chart. What does this tell you? That users are consuming the content. They are looking you know, for the old, they are searching for Old Spice, they are searching for Evian uh, Roller Babies, and, um, and, and that the medium is now you know, beginning to really, really scale. And when users choose what happens, right, every, everybody wins. Right, so when, when consumers, uh, you know, when you guys choose the music that you listen to, uh, the breakfast you eat in the morning, it's intuitive that, that you'd enjoy it more. Uh, but this data comes from a study, uh, it was part of the Vivic Viviki's uh, pool study, and it was meant to better understand the efficacy of choice. Right? So when users chose, and this was still in a constrained choice environment, which is still pre-roll, so think the, uh, the Hulu ad selector, right? three ads, you choose one, uh, when users were able to choose versus an automated pre-roll, brand lift metrics increase, brand trust increase, and brand engagement increases, right? So again, everybody wins, the consumer gets a good experience, right? They chose your ad, they can stop your ad, they can view something else, and then also if they continue to uh, view your ad, uh, marketers uh, benefit. So why video, why social, social video, and, and, and you know, how, how is choice uh, different from other mechanisms, right? Well, for the first time in advertising, by leveraging choice video or whatever choice medium it is, uh, you're able to introduce choice at the uh, top of the purchasing funnel, right, in the awareness phase. So traditionally, what happens in the, uh, in the awareness phase is just you're blasting broadcast messaging uh, to your consumers. By allowing them to choose, right, at the awareness level, you're preconditioning them to choose your brand as you move them down the purchasing funnel, right? And also with choice comes social endorsement, there's opportunities for shares, blog posts, tweets, uh, et cetera. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Dan uh, because his campaign actually generated a ton of that uh, earned media uh, activity and uh, he'll get deeper into that case study. All right, so 
This summer I um, worked with Intel and Toshiba on a social film experience. Uh, experience. It was the uh, Hollywood's first social film and um, it was geared towards the social consumer and a big part of it was uh, based in the video space. So when I said social consumer, you know, it's not going to rehash everything that you probably know or have heard about this group, um, sort of that, I guess, a different or more modern term for the millennial, but um, you know, it's a, it was a tough group to reach and um, you know, we knew we, we needed their help. And one thing that I learned from this group going into it was, um, or after our campaign was over, was that this group may not remember necessarily what, what you say to them, but they'll remember definitely what they did and how they felt uh, with your brand. But, um, you know, what if this group doesn't feel anything at all? You know, what if there's no opinion of your brands? What if there's no feelings towards your brands? And that was a pretty big issue for um, us going into this, is that we didn't have um, an opinion either way of Intel or Toshiba, and, you know, we needed to change that. Um, you know, these two brands were creating, you know, innovative, world-class products, and, but they were going unnoticed by this tech-savvy 20-something. So um, we knew that um, this group was a group that was full of opinions, that had a lot to say, um, but they didn't have an opinion of, of us. So we wanted to create a platform to change that. And instead of simply manufacturing one of ourselves, um, we decided to recruit the social consumer to help us out. So let's take a look at how we did that. So that was the trailer that we um, seeded in the market for the weeks um, prior to the launch. We had an amazing response of auditions. Um, we set up the character profile pages on Facebook and had immediately um, tens of thousands of fans following, uh, anticipating the launch of this experience. It was a 10-day experience um, when all said and done. And, um, you know, I think the buzz that we got from it was more than we could ever, and the, and the press that we got from it was more than we could ever pay for an experience like this. So, um, so coming, coming into, um, you know, how could two brands like Intel and Toshiba become cool in a space, you know, that this social consumer was very protective of? You know, they, they go to these spaces as sort of a retreat, um, maybe almost an escape, an oasis from brands like, like ours. So instead of risking it perceived, uh, intrusion on this space, we decided just to create our own, um, and that's that's what resulted in uh, inside uh, Hollywood's first social film. So this is just a little longer look at at the process. <laughs> Intel and Toshiba wanted to reconnect to younger consumers, a generation that sees computers not only as tools, but as entertainment machines, where they can watch movies, play games, and connect to their friends. So we combined all that to create a new genre of entertainment, and we called it Social Film. To appeal to our audience, we enlisted one of Hollywood's top directors, DJ Caruso, along with rising star Emmy Rossum, to play the part of Christina, a 24-year-old girl trapped in a room with only a laptop and an untraceable internet connection. The film was named Inside, 
as a nod to Intel's iconic campaign, and we broke the story into eight short episodes posted in real time over the course of 11 days. We made it clear to our audience that they could interact with Christina through Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, but that's all we were giving away. It was really going to be up to them to drive the film segments and help Christina make it out alive. These viewers or these participants can help steer the film in, in a different direction. It's a little bit unnerving, but I mean that in an exciting way as a filmmaker. The result was instant. Messages from fans were included as opening quotes to every episode. Posts to her Facebook wall and Twitter account ended up on her screen in the films. And tips from fans affected the actual plot. Like when Christina tried to grab her captor's hand after one of our viewers suggested it. Some fans even went so far as to start blogs and help pages, all in hopes of solving clues to find Christina Parasso. But the greatest show of support happened when Christina's captor challenged her to make a plea for food, conditioning her next meal to the number of likes this video would get. This is the only way that I can get food. Immediately turning every spectator into an active promoter of the idea. Inside took over the internet with over 10 million views, 130,000 tweets, 4 million messages to Christina, and more than 200 stories in the press reaching over 25 million people around the world. After nearly two weeks, Christina was finally rescued in a real-life event that took place at Los Angeles' Union Station. Her whole story included social media posts, a cameo from an audience member selected in our social casting call, and it was all released shortly after the live ending as a single long format film, a social film, created by Hollywood and the web. And proudly brought to you by two of the most innovative brands in the world. This is the story of Inside. Welcome to Social Hollywood. So just to wrap things up here, one thing that um, I would, I, said, I suppose, leave with you all here was, you know, we took a big chance of kind of giving up our brand image and personality to the audience, to the social consumer. Um, so I suggest, um, you know, remember we're in entertainment, and then also be willing to lose control. You know, if you if you have those clients out there who like to keep everything within a certain, you know, certain parameters and, and rules and whatnot. Um, I challenge, challenge you all to kind of to lose control as an advertiser and, and give it up to, the, to this audience because they're more than willing to do the work for you and uh, participate with your brands. So that's all we have. Questions? Great. Thanks, guys. Any questions from the audience? Uh, Eric Perko from Swirl. It's obviously uh, an amazing idea and really well executed. I'm curious what is required budget-wise in terms of production and also um, in, in the way of paid media. Did you guys support this concept and launch it with paid media or was it primarily viral? It was a mix of both. I mean, I, you know, we needed to start somewhere, so we had some paid uh, media efforts in the beginning leading up to especially the auditioning uh, part of it. And once uh, you know, it gained some traction, especially in the social space. Um, a lot of our fans took over for us. Uh, you know, they were spreading the words, words themselves. They were creating a lot of these videos. They were kind of ripping and cutting their own versions of the trailer and whatnot and, and sharing it. Um, so I would say, you know, the, the, the paid, obviously, was the first few weeks, but after that, it, it, it took on a life of its own. Uh, in terms of what we paid, I'm not, you know, not going to share what we paid for the production, but um, you know, for a project like this, it could have been, I mean, it, it is what you make of it, it is what your brand is. Uh, like I said, when they're doing a lot of the heavy lifting for you, you know, you could spend minimal dollars if, they're, if, if you have an audience that's, that's, you know, wanting this. I mean, we, you know, with Intel and Toshiba, I mean, Intel, what do you do with Intel? What do you, when you ask a 22-year-old kid on the street, what he thinks of Intel? He doesn't know, he's seen it, he's heard of it. Um, but yeah, we were able to take a brand like that and, and make it interesting enough, or like I said, provide a space for them to kind of live out these dreams, you know, these, these um, you know, every, every, all the kids nowadays want, and you know, YouTube, they're they, they looking for any way to get famous, any reason to get on, you know, shared and, and, and viral and whatnot. And so we provided that platform where this auditioning where these kids, these, um, you know, this social consumer had a space to promote themselves or, 
Um, hopefully this was their break, their big break, it's seen, whatnot, and they knew they'd be shared with millions of other people. So you know, if you give them that little, uh, that platform, they, they, they take advantage of it, so. And, and <clears throat> it's an interesting question, right? Did you pay for it or did it go viral, right? I, th I think that question presupposes that, you know, there's still stigma associated with paid media uh, when you're working on a viral campaign, but, or, or a social video campaign, choice-based video campaign, right? Um, but some of the biggest campaigns of the last few years, right? you, you know what they are, we know what they are. Uh, we've worked really closely with a lot of those, uh, those clients and most of the work behind the scenes, there's a lot of paid media doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Right? There's so much content out there. I think YouTube's latest stat is 48 hours of uh, video uploaded to YouTube every minute. So with that sheer amount of volume, it's certainly very easy to get lost in the shuffle unless you know, there's a paid strategy to ensure visibility right when you launch, right? So, so the key is you know, part paid. You gotta pay to get you know, the video or whatever asset it is to a certain tipping point where it becomes, you know, it, it has a chance to become part of the cultural relevance, right? After you get to that point, it's really up to the consumer as to whether the, the video is engaging enough to share or pass on or blog about or tum, uh, tumble, uh, et cetera, right? So, um, you know, that's something where we as a company and also as a, as a niche, I guess, uh, uh, industry is, is trying to combat, right? Is that, is that, that stigma with, uh, with paid. Because at the end of the day, it's really up to your creative whether you know, users are gonna decide to, uh, uh, to generate that earned media for you. Thanks. Um, going into this, um, what, what was success going to look like? Or did you have any idea like what your sort of benchmarks for success were going to be? I mean, it seems like you exceeded them, but going yeah. into it, it's like... Yeah, we didn't go that? into this with a goal of um, selling laptops. Um, right. I mean, th I think that would have ruined the project had we done that, had we had uh, part sell. You know, we could, you, know, you probably saw in those videos that there was you know, she used her to cheap a laptop, but we never spoke of it, we never talk, talked about it um, at all. But going into it, you know, we were up against, you know, when you have Toshiba um, as a partner in this, you know, we were up against some, some pretty big competitors who kind of owned the cool space and were very relevant to our, our audience, and we had lost that. So going into it, all we wanted to do were change perceptions of these two brands and, um, you know, we looked at things like brand relevancy and um, purchase intent, things like that, and those numbers pre and post you know, changed dramatically. You know, skyrocketed from um, now this, these two brands were back on the on the radar of this consumer that we thought we were losing. So that for us was success. I mean, the the, the press and the buzz was great, and that was great exposure for us, and uh, it put us in a good in a good light. Um, but you know. At the end of the day, when we saw those those scores and, and that um, from the studies that we had done, that for us was success. We weren't expecting to line Best Buy with people to buy the laptops, at, and like I said, that would have ruined um, this experience. So, um, definitely from our end, from the client's end, it was a success. Any other questions? Or? No. Once, twice. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Hung. Sure. Appreciate it. So that does it for, uh, for OMA Video. Um, once again, I'd like to thank uh, our sponsors and uh, thank you all for uh, spending the day with us. Uh, a couple last uh, end of the day housekeeping items. Uh, please recycle your badges outside if you remember to do so. Uh, you can do that at registration. Uh, and if you uh, 